after much uh, waiting and and anticipation on our side of things, this is another Locked On Big 12 roundtable brought to you by BetOnline and BetOnline.net. A look at the Big 12 odds once again to let uh, a few more people get in on the action and also a look at Big 12 running backs as well. We'll have more right after this. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, once again, hello, everybody. Uh, This is Locked On Big 12 Roundtable. It's a crossover with Jonathan Davis of Locked On Longhorns, Emery Lida of Locked On Texas Tech, and then also we have got our man Drake Toll of Locked On Baylor. Um, so this is running back week here on Locked On Big 12, generally speaking. Last time it was quarterback week, I let these two idiots to my right do the power rankings of quarterbacks, <laughs> and the number two guy got beat out by somebody else in the power By rankings. the number one guy. By the number one guy. By a guy who was, not, who was not in our top five, and then he hit the portal. So these guys are off limits. Um, the first thing we're talking about tonight is, it is the Big 12 championship odds. Uh, Jonathan, you watched our episode yesterday. If you all haven't seen it, Locked On Big 12, we kind of released these and talked about these odds. I converted a lot of the odds from Locked On, or from, excuse me, BetOnline and BetOnline.net, um, from fractional to also like the numerical odds. So they're on screen right now. Um, Jonathan, I defended the hell out of your Texas Longhorns. Do I get a T-shirt? What do I get here? Because I feel like the Longhorns at 2-1 to one are a pretty good bargain right now. They are, and people should be upset that they can't get more value on that pick. Texas is obviously the pick to win the Big 12 next year, and I appreciate you, you know, with all the resistance that you dealt with, having to deal with all the haters, the haters that don't want to acknowledge that Texas is back. They don't want to acknowledge that we have the most talent on offense in the Big 12, possibly the country. We got Quinn Ewers, the mullet. Come on, it all adds up to a Big 12 championship. So people at home should not be upset that Texas is second in the Big 12 championship odds. They should just be upset that it's only plus 200. You can't make too much money on that. Uh, Drake, I'll go to you. So the big fight I got was from Steven Simcox of Locked On Horn Frogs, and he was fighting for your Baylor Bears, who are at 15-2 to two plus 750 right now. Um, he thinks they should be probably ahead of Texas. Now I would say, look, you know, too much transition. And here's the thing. It's not like I don't, we don't like Dave Aranda. We love Dave Aranda. We love the coaching continuity, but they lost a lot. They lost now obviously the quarterback, but they got a kind of probably a better one. They lost the running back, lost their best wide receiver. They lost their two best defense players and some other guys on that defense as well. So, you know, I think it's a pretty fine argument to say, Hey, Baylor's pretty good odds plus plus seven fifty, but there's a reason why they're fourth in the pecking order. Right. Yeah, I'll say this first. Uh, I think the better quarterback is starting now. The reason why is because Jeff Grimes and Dave Aranda and Sean Bell say so. Much more than I can say, right, that Gary Bohannon is the best quarterback. Maybe I agree with that assessment, but the guys who are getting paid millions of dollars to make that call have made the call. I I think they're going to be right in the end just because there's such a high ceiling of playmaking ability for Blake Shapin. But what I kind of want to go to is Jonathan saying, obviously – Texas is the favorite to win the Big 12 next year. I, I'm not, not sure if you've seen the word obviously or how it's changed over time in Webster's Dictionary, but it now means like mandated, like it has to happen. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not so sure that obvious is the right word for any of these teams, really. It feels like the Big 12 is that wide open, even in the top five, right? Like you could see West Virginia finish top three, and I wouldn't be that surprised. You know, you could see Kansas State go nine and three. I wouldn't be that. You know, there's so many things could happen this season of the Big 12, which I love about the conference. But I'll tell you this, if I have one position where I want everybody or almost everybody back, one group, it's the offensive defensive lines. Baylor's going to have eight guys in the box who have a lot of experience. Four out of your five offensive linemen are back. The fifth you're replacing your new guy is probably going to be better than uh, than the guy you're losing. So when your O-line has five guys you trust as, I think, the best O-line in the Big 12, that's why I think Baylor's got a really good shot to win the conference. But, Josh, I'll tell you, their schedule next season, going to Ames, going to Austin, going to Norman, ah, yeah. to Morgantown, look, I think the odds are probably pretty correct when you look at least at their schedule. So, Emery, I'll go to you now. 
Um, I feel like if you locked me in a room with all the coaches for two minutes and made them give me their, you know, their pitches on, on why I should bet in their team. I feel like Joey McGuire would be the guy who would be able to be like, Josh, look, we're, we're 40 to one. You got to put a hundred on us. You have to. And also I'm not sure like at 40 to one, that's a pretty good bargain for a team that's probably got the three best quarterback options of the conference. Like, you know, we, we, talk, we talked about it. Like either one of those guys could end up being a top five quarterback in the league. So 40 to one for your red Raiders, not a bad spot to be. Yeah. I mean, I look at it like at the end of the day, I think that it's deserved to be at 40 to one. I mean, obviously tech has been kind of mediocre the last five, six, 10 years. And it's really hard to put faith in a first year coach, but you look at the way the schedule lines up, you've got kind of the more favorable, even years, obviously home, you have home games against Texas and Oklahoma. You've certainly got a road trip to Waco, which is going to be difficult, but at the same time, it's something where the last time Tech played in Waco, they had decent amount of success. You look at the fact, or excuse me, they have the home game against Baylor, excuse me. Yeah, that. yeah. They've got, yeah, so that's another tri- trip on the Baylor schedule. But then you look out at how, like, the roster s- shapes up this year, and you've got a lot of experience on the offense. And you've got Taj Brooks, the running back, which we're going to talk about. You've got, obviously, the three quarterbacks. And it's okay to be skeptical. I would have had tech a little bit lower than 40 to one. I would have probably thought that's a little bit too harsh on them, but certainly I'm probably not going to put much on them in terms of winning the best bets. I want to focus on two, two teams. And one of them is Baylor. I mean, I think Drake hit it pretty well. Like if you look at how Baylor was really good last year, a lot of it came down to physicality on the offensive and defensive end. And what you have, you have a team that returns a lot of offensive linemen. You have a team that on the front seven has a lot of talent there and certainly i mean you was able to do at the end of the year and obviously you're losing bohannon but at the end of the day i mean if the coaching staff trusts in shape and then that's really not much of a loss i mean they're getting the guy that they still want to start ending up starting so on that hand it's good i just feel like the strength of that baylor team was not necessarily in the skill positions and last year you saw baylor and oklahoma state where they gained an edge on the rest of the conference was in the trenches and this year, I feel like baylor at 15 to 2 seems like a little bit of a stretch obviously drake mentioned the schedule for Baylor is not ideal, but certainly you still have kind of a team that in my opinion looks up pretty well. I think that Oklahoma, obviously without Lincoln Riley, first year of the Venables era is going to be difficult to sort of project it, but having them at plus 175 seems kind of reasonable. Texas, obviously, I mean, look, Jonathan, I just want to say, when was the last time that Texas was actually in contention for the Big 12 championship? And before you say 2018, just remember that team was historically one of the teams that overperformed the most compared to their S or their SP plus ranking and pretty much any ranking throughout the country. And so they were never in the fight with Oklahoma, but beyond that year, is there any time in the last decade where they've even come close to a conference championship? Andre 3000 said spaceships don't come equipped with rear view mirrors. They dip and we're focused <laughs> on the 2022 season and Texas is going to win the big 12 in 2022. Okay, so, right. uh, so hold on, hold on. So on, on this point, and I made this point last night, but I just want to make it again. Like from a talent perspective, Texas far and away has the most talented quarterback, running back, and wide receiver in the conference. There is no disputing that that between Ewers, Robinson, and Worthy, there is not a more talented player in the conference at those positions. Which right, but the- you know, and Jordan Addison but just here's 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 one of those players you know, has I'm, never I'm taken a collegiate count. snap. Okay, but but okay, but you know what? Also, a lot of like, okay ever so in his life, he is he is one of the most highly projected uh, recruits ever. And people say, "Oh, he played Ohio State." Guess what? One of the top two picks in next year's draft was ahead of him. He was not going to play, guys. So he was going to get that cash. All right. But my my thing is is like when people use that argument and say he's never taken a collegiate snap, like why is the the backdrop to that always well he's going to be bad because he's never taken a collegiate snap? Like what if he Stroud had last year and he what if what if what if the beginning of his collegiate Hall of Fame career starts against Louisiana Monroe? We're not Spencer Sanders. (laughs) We're not talking about Texas being like a good team, right? We're talking about them being in contention in the obvious pick for the conference championship. In a conference where everybody else lost a lot, though. Right, but you're looking at the other the other co favorite of the conference in Oklahoma has a quarterback that has started over twenty games. They lost games their, their coach and their coordinators. Though. Right, and we're just talking and quarterbacks. The, and the other team has Steve Sarkeesian as coach, a guy that literally 
completely failed out at USC. His Washington teams were mediocre. His team at Texas guy. last year somehow managed it's to miss a bowl sport. game. We're, we're yes, his, t- his team last year missed a bowl game despite having a top five quarterback, top five running back, top five wide receiver group. Still missed a bowl game last year. Like you look at all, you look at the talent level that Texas has had on paper. That's not been the issue, especially in the skill groups. Like I, I mean, agree, sure. but but th- but this group is exponent. This group is right. different. Talent. I'm not. I'm not here to argue that they're not going to make a bowl game. I think they're a better team than they were last I'm, year, pretty substantially. I'm not but here trying to pitch you on six and six. I'm pitching you on ten and two and nine and three. Right, like, right. I'm sa- I'm yeah, saying man. for a team to for a team to actually be like outright top ten preseason Big Twelve favorites or whatnot, you would think that they would have a precedent of actually having success in the conference. But no, instead you have a team that admittedly is more skilled than what we've seen in the past but at the end of the day like that's not been the issue for texas if it was if the issue for texas was skill position players you would think that you wouldn't have had Bijan robinson last year you would think that you wouldn't have a top five quarterback a guy in casey thompson that was pretty hyped coming in people were thinking that his production level would be at a minimum what ellinger's was and it straight up wasn't like these things there's a lot of variance in texas for whatever reason the last decade or so has never been able to put up their end of the bargain. So I just have a hard time putting them anywhere more than second or third in the conference. And if I'm wrong about it, wouldn't it surprise me? I mean, they're a really talented team, but you just can't look at the last 10 years and especially look at last year when they didn't make a bowl game and be like, okay, yes, this is the overwhelming favorite in the conference. It's an obvious pick. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, Emery, Emery, the good thing is when these aren't the last 10 years odds, these are the 2022 odds. (laughs) And with all due respect, Casey Thompson is not Quinn Ewers. And like Josh said, our running back room is better. Our receiver room is better. We added a Jai Hall. Once again, Jordan Addison, who it may be a smoke screen. He may be going to USC after all, but he did visit the University of Texas. We had him up in the Fairmont in Austin with a box combo from Raising Canes. And, you know, they've offered him an NIL deal too. So, you know what I mean? I don't know. You know, we could be I heard exponentially I better. told me he had a very nice steak dinner last night with some former Texas players. I'm just saying, it might be going hey, well. Matthew McConaughey and, was in and, Waco last night. So, just saying, even he's well, in the transfer portal right now. Even he... <laughs> He's searching for it's an hour and a half drive. There you Look, go. He's got a, he's got, he's already got property. He's looking at property. I'll um, say this. I think we, uh, I saw a tweet out there that was like, you know, Mac Brown's last season. I think he didn't have an NFL draft pick or, or failed to make a bowl game. And yeah. kind of the same thing yeah. for us, uh, for, for, uh, who, who is the, who, how, who was next? They keep changing like underwear. Uh, oh my gosh. Charlie What's strong. Who? Charlie wrong right and then you go into the uh the tom, tom herman, herman era that they all managed to lose the camp draft pick and miss a bowl game <laughs> year number one under steve sarkeesian clean sweep clean sweep and now this team is number two in the preseason next year what if they finish listen finish third in the conference you know what i won't be that surprised if they finish seventh in the conference you know what i won't be that surprised but if they finish the first, 12, I will not be surprised. I would be Look surprised. Look, and, now, and, and I know I know where the reservations is coming from outside of, you know, Quinn Ewers not throwing a collegiate pass, even though he's clearly the most talented quarterback in the Big 12. I know it's coming from the defense. There's some question marks on the offensive and defensive lines. You might, you guys made some really good points about how that's where games are won. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to find a way to stop people. And your teams and the rest of the teams on this list are not going to be able to stop the Texas Longhorns. This – Team I mean, that you talked about that year, underachieved but... exactly. Well, I didn't no, want to bring the, it up, the, 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 the but seventy. Is, we scored seventy on Texas Tech. Games. We had a they lead on to... Baylor going into the fourth right. quarter. We're going to close that game this the year. How'd the game go? Were, who who won? They were leading OU. <laughs> they were leading. They were they were <laughs> leading Baylor. Right. True. They uh. They, who were else leading were they? OU, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, State they, and Baylor they were all going into the fourth quarter. Seventeen on Oklahoma State if it weren't for a pick six. Like and and then guys, there are they could flip all of these games and I would not be shocked. I, I want to mention this on OU's front, though. Like, you know, we're having this conversation about Texas, and I really think OU is getting the head nod of like, yeah, this makes sense. They lost everything, but this just yeah. speaks to what a great program they are that we're like, eh, Brent Venables, it sounds good. Jeff Levy, it sounds great. Dylan Gabriel, it sounds awesome. Like, all, all this sounds really, you know, Eric Wright running back, okay, that sounds really good, too. Yeah, all right, you know, good wide receivers, and we'll see what the defense can do under a new mind. Like, Oklahoma's kind of getting the handshake and hand wave and being like, all right, we, we, we trust you. I guess we'll see you in Dallas in December. Like Emory, you know, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't be shocked if we don't, but it, 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 I, I wouldn't be shocked. But like, it, it kind of feels deserved, right? Yeah, I mean, 
I guess I look at it like at the end of the day, pretty much every team in the conference has some sort of major question that coming right. into the season they're going to have to answer. Obviously, but they have pedigree. We've we've, te- we've touched on Texas Tech, Baylor, Texas. All of those teams have one significant or multiple significant issues. I mean, and I think that if you look at Oklahoma, they lost everything, but they're still a team where pretty much we haven't seen them get comfortably beaten in Big 12 play over the last decade, or at least since 2014. And obviously last year they lost out. I don't think anyone would sort of argue that. And obviously they lost Lincoln Riley. They lost a ton of talent offensively, but this is still an Oklahoma team has the pedigree from a roster building standpoint. I mean, you would say, I will say, I would say I would take Texas's skill position players over them, but I don't think it's as huge of a gap as people have made it out to be. And I also think that Oklahoma as a whole, their roster is still arguably the most talented or the second most talented team in the conference. Venables, sure, it's a question mark. It's a question mark with any new coach in the conference, but you're going to have that. And I don't think a second year Steve Sarkeesian is deserving of more uh, lenience or confidence in him. I think that if anything, this first year was a slight downturn towards him. So you just look at Yeah, you just look at what every team has. And I would say Oklahoma comes into this conference, and I don't think that they're anywhere near an overwhelming favorite. I don't think any team in the conference is a favorite. But you look at what they've had in the past, there's a reason they're rated that high. And I would also say that they have the balance on the roster to where, like, I I wouldn't feel comfortable picking them in the preseason just because I don't feel comfortable with anyone. But out of all the teams, I feel like they have sort of the most established background and the established sort of for for their t- season and, and i want to mention before drake you go like look at the odds so look at the odds for the other schools uh and other conferences bama's around even odds um i think ohio state's better than even odds uh and then you know you look at acc i think clemson's, clemson's around better even than odds. even yeah they're, yeah they're, they're yeah they're right there too i mean i would say that you know like as much we we can say oh use the favorite but emory you're right not an overwhelming favorite. So, Drake, what was your, your your thoughts on that? Here's what I know. Texas probably does have – I'll say it. They probably have the best skill position players on the offensive side of the ball in the conference. I, I don't think you can disagree with that right now. They're number two. Oklahoma State has a returning quarterback and a head coach who's been in the Big 12 for like a gajillion years and went to the Big 12 championship last year. They're really starting to make their bet on the defensive side of the ball. I don't think that's going to change. They're number three. Baylor returns its entire offensive line effectively. It's quarterback and a guy who has a facility record at AT AT&T Stadium in Dallas. A majority of the defense, including the entire defensive line, they're number four. Oklahoma has a new head coach and half their roster you're going, that guy plays for USC now. Like when USC trots on the field next year, it's just Oklahoma West. And we think Oklahoma is the favorite in the Big 12 next season, number one. And everybody's going to like, yeah, no, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I, 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 it makes no sense to me. I, I could have seen Oklahoma at three or four. I'll tell you this. If you are poor, <laughs> I'm a college kid. I am in that boat nine times out of ten. If I have my final $10 and I can do anything with it, Putting it at Oklahoma to win the conference at plus 175 odds is a great way to never see that $10 that, that's again. That's a bad usage of money, but who should be favorite? If, if it, who should be the favorite? I, I could see... I could see Baylor. No. I could see Oklahoma State. I could see Texas as no, much I'm not, as I'm at, I'm at, no, 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 no. I'm asking you who should be the favorite then. In the Big 12. <laughs> In the Big 12. Well, if, if you're not going to say Oklahoma shouldn't be, then who should be? There's a team. In between Dallas and Austin. All right, I'm gonna go. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do an ad read now. We're gonna do an ad read. I'm not gonna hear that shit. You kidding me? Running backs. Uh, we're, we're gonna hear an ad read. We're gonna talk about running backs after this. All right, today's show is brought to you by our friends from Bet Online and BetOnline.net. We just did a whole segment on odds from our friends at BetOnline and BetOnline.net. Have you all been on Twitter? They're the first ones out to have complete odds for all of these conferences. Go there to BetOnline and BetOnline.net today. Uh, NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs, esports. Uh, you know, college football futures, UFC, boxing, Bellator, uh, you know, F1, NASCAR, whatever you want. They've got their at bet online and betonline.net today. Uh, go there, bet online. It's where the game starts. All right, let's talk running backs. So I'm going to do my power rankings tomorrow. So you clowns won't be involved, except for you, Jonathan. You do not disgrace yourself. So I'll, you're off the hook on this, just Emery and, and Drake. Um, But you get first crack at the running back. So it cannot be disputed that the best running back room in all of the Big 12 resides in Austin. B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson. I I was talking yesterday with Fozzie Whitaker, and I I posed this question to him. I said, Fozzie, 
Do you think that Texas should maybe manage B. John Robinson's workload throughout the season to make sure that they don't end up a situation like last year where, you know, that he's hurt towards the back end and he goes, what are you talking about? No, no, not at all. Not at all. But, you know, I think, the, the, you know, he's saying, Hey, he's your best player. Ride him. We're not sure what everybody else is going to do. Quinn Ewers, you know, we're not, you know, not sure how great he is to your all this point. Like I, I get that, but in that offense, I feel like your best thing to do is, you know, if you have to ride him a time, sure, ride him, but try to manage the workload, share it with Roshan, spread the ball out. And that's how everybody wins. And then maybe late in the season, you have to ride him or certain games to ride him, ride him. But I would be more selective with the carries. What do you think about that thought? No, I completely agree. I said on the podcast that I would like to see Roshan Johnson get um, at least an 80 to 20 split. And I know that Keelan Robinson is going to be in there too. Mm -hmm. uh, The transfer from Alabama a couple of years ago, you got uh, Jaden Blue, Jonathan Brooks. So they have a lot of talented running backs. Like you said, the best running back room in the Big 12. But I do think they should manage uh, B. John Robinson's carries. Of course, he's the bell cow. Of course, he's going to get the majority of the touches. On offense, but like you said, you have to satisfy all of these receivers in Ajay Hall, Isaiah Nair, Jordan Whittington, Xavier Worthy, possibly Jordan Addison. And then you, <laughs> you have Jalil Billingsley at tight end, and then you have the running back. So I think that they should uh, manage B. John Robinson's carries. And of course, he's going to give his all next year to make sure that Texas wins the Big 12 or at least is second in the Big 12 next year. But of course, he has his eyes on the NFL as well. So I think he manages carries, make sure he stays healthy dominate with him when you need to. Um, but you also have Roshan Johnson who had a 55-yard touchdown run in the orange and white game when B. John Robinson didn't play, and he would start for most teams in the Big 12. So I think you need to get Roshan Johnson on the field and Keelan Robinson on the field as much as possible too, while still maintaining B. John Robinson's snaps and touches as him being the best offensive player in the country. Yeah, I mean, he was averaging was like around like six yards per touch last year. But it's great. But also, you know, we saw him slow down at times. Um, so that's a huge question. All right. So Emory, I'm gonna go to you next because your team, you know, this conference as a whole, right? Last year it was so running back dependent. The one school where we didn't really see that was, was Texas tech. They're kind of an outlier in this situation. Now you got a lot of talented backs returning, but they're also one of these schools. There's a few in the big 12 that is dealing with a coaching change, especially on offense. Was that Kitley coming in? So what do you think for guys like Sir Roderick Thompson, what, what the future is for them this year? What's their workload look like? And does their workload, while it might be the same in some senses, you know, of, of touches, does it change in terms of role, how they get those touches, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I look at it like when you look at how Tech sort of split the carries last year, they had guys like Taj Brooks that got a lot of minutes. They had, um, obviously, Sir Roderick Thompson, really kind of a goal line back, but also just in general played a lot of snaps. And, once he got healthy towards the middle part of the year, you really sort of saw his workload increase. And then you had guys like Xavier White and Charis Townsend who got more more snaps at certain points of the year, but also kind of started to split out towards the slot. I think that's the big change you're going to see this year with Zach Kitley is you're going to see those two guys who've already kind of moved into kind of a flex spot this year, play more snaps out in the out in the wide receiver positions and sort of utilize more in the pass game. And then in, from a back standpoint, it's really going to come down to Thompson and Brooks I think Taj Brooks last year had a really good first three games before he got injured in the Texas game or missed the Texas game because of an injury and kind of took him a while to get back but we saw against Iowa State what his potential was obviously like I mentioned the Houston game at the start of the year was a really good game for him I think he's going to be kind of a main feature but also Sir Roderick Thompson as well a guy with three years of Big 12 experience three years of kind of leading the team in rushing touchdowns three years of kind of being a workload or a workhorse So there's really a lot of versatility. I would say that using Brooks in the passing game is going to be probably more important than using Thompson. But certainly I would expect both of those guys to play in the front end of the fold as well. Also, Cameron Valdez is a freshman from last year that I felt like had a pretty good performance as well. Looked good in the spring and I feel like could be sort of the third wheel now that White and Townsend are going to be kind of more in the flex positions. And then Drake, you you cover a team that was – running back reliant last year. I mean, Abram Smith and Tristan Ebner, you know, through a variety of ways, but those two guys are the heart and soul of the offense. It was a, it was a run the football and play defense type team like Gary Bahanna manage games with a change of quarterback with a loss of Abram Smith and Ebner. Can, can Baylor maintain the identity from last year? Maybe the offensive line, defensive lines will help them do so, but let's talk about running backs here. Do they have the horses in the backfield to do so this season? 
Well, I, I think the first thing that I go to is Blake Shapin being named the starter is a boat of confidence in Baylor's running back room and offensive line. The reason why, Gary Bohannon is an exponentially better running quarterback than Blake Shapin. That cannot be argued. I mean, exponentially better. So I believe that pulling Blake Shapin into that starter spot means that you can give away a great running style quarterback in Gary Bohannon. But I want to hear, I'll pitch it to Jonathan since Emery has taken a short hiatus. Jonathan. Can you name you follow college football pretty yeah. darn closely? The Big Twelve. Can you name one Baylor running back? No. Exactly. No. Nobody can. Nobody can. Who's in the backfield this season? Tay McWilliams, Craig Williams, Squirrel yeah. Williams. Who's like that guy? Also, is like Craig, Craig Williams. No, Craig Williams sounds like he does the players' taxes. Yeah, uh, he, he literally, the football. literally does. Like the guy is twenty seven years old. I'm pretty sure he has been at Baylor for so Richard freaking Jr., long. Yes. And you're looking at Quaylen Jones too, who's never taken really a, a meaningful snap at the at the running back spot for Baylor. So here, here is Baylor's best part of the entire running back group. It involves sixth year senior Grant Miller, sixth year senior Khalil Keith, sixth year senior Jacob Gall, and fifth year senior and Big Twelve offense lineman of the year Connor Galvin. That's the running back room right there. That's your offensive line that no matter who's back there is going to be able to gain a couple of yards behind them. So I'll tell you this, the one thing that gives me confidence, Josh, I never really liked Treston Ebner running the football at Baylor. I right. still didn't really like it last year. He wasn't great, but I'll no. tell you this day year one under Dave Aranda, when Larry Fedora was the OC, Ebner had 107 rushing yards year two under Dave Aranda. He had 800 rushing yards. So if you can take a guy like Treston Ebner, who was not great on the ground, but explosive in the passing game and turn him into an 800 yard rusher. I've got confidence what Dave Aranda puts out there with this O line. Yeah. It just shows, you know, the, the greater conversation about the conference really guys this year is like last season, it was so running back dependent, right? I mean, I, I did the numbers, the the amount of of carries yards and touchdowns that this conference just lost at that position is absurd. Think about what Brees Hall did, what Abram Smith did. Uh, you know what guys? I'm totally blanking. Uh, who's a kid from Oklahoma State? Totally blanking on his name. Uh, Jalen Warren. What he did last season. Even guys like Letty Brown. Even guys, oh, we're losing. We're just losing every over and over again. <laughs> Even guys like Zach Evans, right? Zach Evans had you know a crazy great year, but like that guy was an incredibly talented running back. I mean, he was one of the two most talented backs in the conference last year. I would say second, just behind uh, you know Bijan Robinson. Incredible talent. Like th this conference lost so much at running back. So I think it's a really exciting year between the um, I would say like the establishment, right, which we have at Texas. Um, the question mark schools like we have at Baylor and then the kind of established stable schools that I would say are TCU and Texas tech. And, and overall, you know, sure. A lot of this is line play. I, bet, I think you're right, Drake. I think a lot of these lines are going to dictate, you know, how much is of the quarterbacks and how much is the running backs this year? Because this conference, you know, like first team, all uh, first team, all big 12 last year, the quarterback was Spencer Sanders. Right. Hmm. And, and we don't love, I, I can tell you two boys in the bottom right now, do not love Spencer Sanders. I do that for a fact. So I, I think it's pretty interesting uh, where our conference is at, at that point. Drake, I'll let you give a crack just in that, that generally no, speaking. Yeah, I, I'll say, Josh, that the two teams that played in the Big 12 championship last season were not offensive teams. No way, no how. 21-16, the final score in the championship game. Baylor didn't have to score in the second half to still win that game, and they won it off a defensive Hail Mary in the end. I think that's the trend of the Big 12 until the new four teams come in and Texas and Oklahoma go out. This conference in the next two or three years is going to trend defense. Uh, trend defense. I think Joey McGuire is going to do that at Texas Tech as well, even with Kitley, who's an electric offensive coordinator. Uh, and Texas can do whatever they want in the SEC. But I think this conference is going to continue to trend defense, and that's going to hold again next year. And so, I mean, I... I Maybe your running game reflects that as the defenses get bigger, you know, and teams start trying to build that SEC caliber of size and strength. It's going to fall more to me on the offensive line than it is necessarily your, your running back. And Jonathan, your team last year was one of the struggle, the struggle of that position. And that's something that we know OU and Texas are trying to build as they head to the SEC. Yeah, we did struggle on the offensive line. They did bring in, uh, seven offensive linemen in the 2022 class, the two best offensive linemen in Texas, two five stars. Uh, it remains to be seen how many of those are going to start this year, though. And then, you know, if they do, when they come over the summer, if they do get the starting job, 
you're relying on true freshmen, you know, right out the gate to to try to be improved and uh, compete for a Big 12 title. So um, I'm not going to sit on here and, and drink too much Kool-Aid. The offensive line is definitely a question mark for Texas, even if you have Lambeau Robinson, uh, Raising Kane Robinson behind him, you know. Mm. So uh, we'll see what they're able to do uh, this year with the offensive line. But, you know, until they get out there on the field and, and prove me different, that's definitely a question mark going into the season, the offensive line for Texas. Yeah, Emery, your thoughts on kind of that quarterback running back balance this year? Do you, you know, do, do you think the quarterback, I, I mean, I think the quarterbacks this conference on the whole, I want to say they're better than last year. And the running backs are obviously a step back just because they, I mean, they lost so many awesome guys. Do you think we see that balance maintained from last year or do we think you, you just, we just see transition based off personnel? Well, I think that a lot of it comes down to the offensive lines of each team and kind of how they're comfortable. And I would say certainly from a pure quarterback quality standpoint, like I would be shocked if Spencer Sanders ends up being first team all big 12 again this year. Like if that happens, something's gone really wrong. Either guys have gotten injured or simply. Okay, the Cedric, also, also, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I want to just like, let's, let's, let's just like acknowledge what you said. If the all big 12 first team quarterback were to win that award again this year, it, something has gone horribly wrong. Continue. Yes. That's yeah, so that should it. that should sort of solidify that the quarterbacks are generally higher quality than last year. Like you mentioned, the running backs obviously you lose a lot of talent in that position. But at the same time, like I mean, we've seen running back is a relatively replaceable position. I mean, right. as harsh as that sounds, like there are a lot of guys that can provide 90 to 95 percent of the production that you've already seen. I think that Texas, obviously, Bijan Robinson is kind of the outlier in the conference, I would say, and being an elite level running back that we've seen since the high school days. But on the flip side, Texas has an offensive line that has more question marks than a good good part of the conference. And we've seen that that's a limiting factor in the running game. And especially when you get into these matchups against teams with experienced defensive teams like a Oklahoma State or like a Baylor. And so for me, just kind of looking at the difference between the quarterbacks and the running backs, like I feel like a lot of times this year you're not going to have as much of a reliance on the running game just to outright carry teams just because – like the quarterback play is simply better pretty much across the board. I mean, there's only a couple of schools I would say that isn't the case for, and I'd say Oklahoma is probably the biggest example. But outside of that, I mean, you could pretty much make the argument every team is better off in the passing game. And the running game, you lose a lot of talent, but at the same time, you do have you do at least have the offensive lines. Generally speaking, a lot of them come back and are mostly intact. I mean, Baylor obviously has the four stars coming back. You've got Oklahoma State has experience there. You've got Texas Tech. You've got Kansas State. Those teams all generally have experience along the offensive line. So looking across the conference, like I think that the amount of experience you have on the offensive lines is going to allow the running game to kind of be still kind of something where the Big 12 can feast on, especially – Four teams, I mean, that have utilized in the past. I mean, last year, it really was a running-based conference. And I think that the quarterbacks being better is going to help but not completely change the dynamics of the conference. All right, fellas, good stuff. Let you guys, it's uh, time for the plugs. So everybody plug your content. Jonathan, you're up first. Plug it all in its variety. What do you got going on? Uh, locked on Longhorns on YouTube. Locked on Horns on Twitter. Quinn Ewers for Heisman. There you go. Drake. Oh, right. Locked on Baylor on uh, on Twitter. Josh Pate joined the show yesterday, so check that show out on Locked on Baylor on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. And Blake Shapin is the best quarterback in the Big 12. Gary Bohanna would have been second. There you go. Emery. All right, so Locked on Texas Tech on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And then beyond that, you can follow us on Twitter at Locked on TTU. You can follow me, Eddie Razor 41 And you can hear me talk about Zach Kitley being the best offensive coordinator in the nation and how good our basketball team is on a daily basis. I see you all tracking that recruiting very closely. You guys can find me on Twitter at Josh Neighbors underscore. You guys can find the show at LO Big 12. Find us on uh, YouTube and also wherever you guys get your podcasts. All right, friends, this was fun. We'll do it again. Uh, whenever we have something arcane to argue about. But good stuff tonight, guys. Talk to you soon.